Good morning, everyone. Uh, I thought we'd get started. We were waiting for some of the traffic to clear, um, which is why we started late. Um, I'm Barry Pavel. I'm the Vice President of the Atlantic Council and also the Director of the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. Thanks for joining us for the launch of the book, The Future Can't Wait. Um, at the Atlantic Council and in the Scowcroft Center in particular, we have a growing practice that we call the Strategic Foresight initiative um, in which we work on understanding how do long-range global trends uh, impact prosperity, security, development, society, and in particular um, the global community as well as the U.S. And then we, we try to develop strategies for some of the key issues for dealing with those uh, different circumstances. Today we're, uh, we have meetings in the Pentagon on this issue and uh, I'm leaving a little earlier from this session to go talk to a group in Roslyn about these issues. So it's a growing practice. Um, just last week, we held in this room, although it was bigger, um, our annual conference on these issues, which we called the Strategic Foresight Forum, where we explored this year the theme of harnessing disruption. In other words, to, how do we uh, look at technology? How do we leverage technology with policy to deal with some of the broader global challenges that we face? Uh, in particular, some of the projected trends having to do with resources and extreme climate, uh, rural and urban migration, and of course, major political shifts. Um, I encourage all of you, if you get the chance to get on the website, we, uh, all of the panels are on YouTube. Um, the statistics that I just got yesterday on the media uh, impressions on Twitter, they count impressions, and I guess it, it was over 8 million uh, impressions, including over 1.5 million just on the last panel alone from the conference last week. The last panel featured uh, Brent Scowcroft, Peter Ho, and Peter Schwartz talking about global geopolitical um, issues in that uh, space. So it's re really a worthwhile um, set of issues, and last week in particular was a worthwhile set of discussion. And today we think this continues that set of discussions. Uh, the book that is being released today really charts a new way forward for foreign aid by showcasing over the horizon opportunities that the development world must address today in order to build a brighter future. The book is a collection of 10 essays from leading futures thinkers and was the outcome of AID's first ever symposium on future development challenges that was held two years ago and it was co-hosted by the State Department, the Wilson Center, and the National Defense University. We're very pleased that all these organizations are here today um, and, and also with the essays authors who, are, who I'm told are seated before me. Um, someone can verify that later. Uh, and so without saying too much more, let me, just, let, let me give the floor to um, AID Associate Administrator Mark Firestein. Uh, very briefly, he is also the Assistant Administrator for Latin America and the Caribbean. He previously served as principal and vice president at the international polling firm Greenberg Quinlan Rosner and also served as director of, of AID's Global Elections Office. Following his remarks, we'll have a great panel featuring uh, Strategic Foresight Initiative Director Matt Burroughs, uh, who works in the Scowcroft Center, uh, Rich Chincata, a demographer in residence at the Stimson Center, and also a global fellow there, Jeff DeBelko, Director of Environmental Studies at Ohio University's Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs, and Susan Reichley, counselor to AID, whom I worked with um, in the White House. And the session will be moderated by, Mark, by Roger Mark D'Souza, the Wilson Center's Director of the Population, Environmental Change, and Security Program and Global Health Initiative. So thank you again for coming, and we really look forward to a fantastic panel. My, um, I, think I'm, my, I think I'm hooked <laughs> up here. Let's not double mic you. Okay. Okay. Am I on? Yes, yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just told by a member. Oops. I was just told by a member of the audience that I have a distracting uh, tie. Um, I like to give audiences <laughs> options, so you can either listen to me, you can just look at me, <laughs> um, look at my tie, or you can do, try to do both. <laughs> so um, I'm very, really pleased to, to be here at Atlantic Council again. I was here a month ago uh, to launch the USAID's uh, urban uh, policy. And as I noted then, Atlantic Council has really become a, just an invaluable uh, resource for USAID and for the entire development community. The people you have, the products you produce are really just really uh, important to us. 
I'm also delighted the Woodrow Wilson Center is co-hosting uh, this book launch. Uh, they are neighbors of ours uh, in the Reagan building, and they're, they're good neighbors. You don't make a lot of noise and <laughs> don't leave a lot of trash out. So. Um, but they hosted the original symposium or, uh, in 2011, and they've also been just been terrific partners uh, for us in, in just so many endeavors. I do want to uh, thank a few individuals uh, in particular, um, Matt Burrows, who's one of the true pioneers in futures analysis. Uh, he used to work at the National Intelligence Council and now working on strategic foresight initiative at the Atlantic Council. Uh, today's moderator, I want to recognize as well, uh, Roger Mark D'Souza from the Wilson Center. Great to see you here. And Linton Wells, I'm not sure, is Linton here? Uh, Linton's not here, but we'll recognize him anyway. He's from the National Defense University, and he lent his prestige and acumen to this effort, along with generous funding support uh, to publish the book. So without him, there would be, would be no book. We would not be here. There would be no snacks. Are there snacks? I'm not sure. Um, and finally, I want to thank all the uh, essay authors, editors, and uh, book reviewers who are here uh, as, as well. And of course, my USAID colleagues, who have taught me all about futures analysis, very much uh, grateful to them. Now, my predecessor, Don Stein Steinberg, he spoke at the symposium in 2011, and he wrote the foreword uh, to the book. And in both, you may have noticed, he dwelled at length on Isaac Asimov. Uh, now, I'm a bit less cultured, a little, little less literate uh, than Don. My vision of the future comes from Lost in Space. Remember Lost in Space, uh, the program when we were kids? I know, I see some young people here with just blank faces. You have no idea what Lost in Space is. <laughs> Uh, the Jetsons, maybe, you know, the Jetsons. But Lost in Space was sort of a, a step up uh, from, the, from, the, from the Jetsons. I think that's, Jetsons is more Susan Reichley style. But um, in any case, actually, I used to do my own sorts of future analysis. As, as Barry mentioned, I worked as a pollster uh, for many years, and political clients would pay us uh, to project electoral outcomes. And we were pretty good at it. Uh, but of course, we were only looking a few weeks out, a few months out, uh, generally speaking, in some cases, uh, just a few days. Uh, but the truth is, that's not really futures analysis. And futures analysis is really more than prediction. It implies examining different future development scenarios. So instead of looking at three to five year program cycles, which is the norm for USAID and for other uh, similar agencies, we can instead conduct a systematic assessment of trends, patterns, and data projections and look, say, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ahead. And then based on those scenarios, we can make pro proper adjustments in our approach today. Now, as, as we in USAID think about futures analysis and, and how we can use it, uh, we think a lot about this amazing moment that we have right now in development. And today we stand within reach of a world that was once unimaginable, uh, but that is a world without extreme poverty. Now, projections differ. Uh, but most experts believe we can reduce the number of people living in extreme poverty from what is today 17% of the world. So about one out of six people living in extreme poverty. Uh, it's believed we can reduce that to roughly 3% by 2030, which is extraordinary, 17% down to 3% over the next 17 years. And President Obama spoke about this in his State of the Union speech uh, last year, and he called on Americans to help eradicate extreme poverty in the next two decades. So USAID and the development community overall, uh, we are increasingly focused on that goal. And it's always been part of what we do. And now the idea is to try to figure out um, how we can focus on that, how we can really accelerate uh, the effort. And we believe we have a roadmap out of extreme poverty, and it, and it, and it requires two things broad-based economic growth, number one, and then two, clear, transparent, democratic governance. Now, fortunately, we have new approaches and new, new tools to achieve that goal. First, we're taking much more advantage of public-private partnerships. Um, private investment now in emerging economies dwarfs official development assistance. So we're increasingly relying on public-private partnerships to deliver results, and a good example of that is President Obama's Power Africa initiative, uh, which encourages countries to make energy sector reforms while connecting entrepreneurs to investment opportunities that are created by those reforms themselves. In fact, Dr. Shah, the head of USAID, uh, is in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo as we speak, um, looking to, uh, look, focusing on the Power Africa and looking to uh, add, add new countries and uh, new private sector partners to that initiative. Now, another component of this new model, the new development model, is a focus on science and technology. 
<coughs> and as we know, new technologies have transformed the lives of billions of people in the furthest corners of the globe. Uh, one of the most important to us and to the entire development community has been mobile phones, which I'll, I'll speak about in a second. Uh, but also in agriculture, we're seeing some extraordinary developments, uh, such as disease-resistant seeds. Uh, we've seen the use of social media, um, and it challenged authoritarianism in the Middle East. We've seen it unite families, uh, separated during an earthquake in Haiti, and a whole, and a whole range of other uh, uses as well. But in order to deploy these tools effectively, we need to use science-based futures tools, such as forecasting and scenario building, to guide our strategic decisions. And this is where futures analysis really comes into play. Now, the truth is, the development community is not always taking advantage of futures analysis or, or such approaches. And our colleagues in intelligence and defense have done much better, frankly, than, than we have. And we need to do that as well. We also need to harness a, a much broader community of innovators and entrepreneurs to help us. We need to engage with leaders in futures analysis who stay ahead of the development curve by identifying emerging global and local trends. And they can help us align programs to remain in sync with key trends like urbanization and climate change. And ultimately, futures analysis will play a big role in which countries we work in, which sectors we work in, uh, which partners we choose to work with, and what innovations we ultimately invest in. Now, USAID is already reaching out to non-traditional partners, and we have a few mechanisms to do that. Uh, one is the Development Innovations Ventures Fund, uh, which supports entrepreneurs who have a great idea but need the resources to test it and bring it to scale. And just one example of that, we invested in a team of young graduates who started a company called Egg Energy that provides families with rechargeable batteries they can rent, that they, they can rent to power their homes for five nights at a time. We're also tapping into, into the intellectual power of our academic institutions through an alliance called the Higher Education Solutions Network, where researchers are using science, technology, and engineering tools to work with us to solve some of the world's most challenging development problems. Now, such approaches help USAID to take advantage of the many development theorists and practitioners, economists, demographers, scientists, and futurists who are exploring and discussing emerging development trends that will shape our collective policies and programs long into the future. And just to offer a few examples of how um, USAID and, and, and our partners are using futures analysis, and Susan Reichley will speak a bit more uh, to this later. The use of mobile phone technologies and their applications obviously plays a significant <coughs> role in today's world, uh, especially true in developing countries. Today, 6.8 billion mobile cellular phones are subscribed around the world, 6.8 billion, and 5 billion of them are in developing countries. The number of smartphone users in developing countries has reached 1.1 billion. So we are therefore expanding on innovative mobile phone technologies and the latest apps to improve banking, provide health care, monitor elections, uh, help farmers, boost local trade. We're also working to uh, expand the use of text messaging for humanitarian assistance and post-disaster recovery. Um, in the area of education, we're trying to figure out how we can use these new technologies. Now, our principal goal as an agency has not changed. We are, we are focused on improving early grade reading. That is the, the, the heart of our, of our education strategy. Uh, but we have much more varied methods to do that now. One of those is same language subtitling, which is the practice of subtitling programs on TV in the same language as the audio. And there's a company called Planet Reads, uh, which uses same language subtitling to boost literacy in India by linking reading with movies, TV programs, and music videos. Um, and this project, uh, which is an innovation sponsored in part by USAID, has already benefited more than 200 million Indian children. Now, also based on future trends analysis, USAID is increasingly looking at how to improve road safety and increase driver education and awareness. And this is not the kind of you know, topic that development or practitioners tended to be focused on in the past. But we now know that statistics uh, show that in India, for example, more people will die from, from uh, vehicular deaths than from malaria in 15 years. And that's just a great example of how we're able to sort of take this data, project into the future, and, and adjust our programming accordingly uh, today. We're also reassessing how our economic growth strategies, especially with regard to small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, to see how we might take advantage of upcoming trends in 3D printing, robotics, and distributive manufacturing. 99% of all businesses worldwide are SMEs, 
and we believe that 3D printing can revolutionize the production of a wide range of products in the developing world by removing most of the constraints of geography, labor, and ready access to a range of materials and make these SMEs that much more productive. Um, I, I noted Susan will expand a bit more on, on some of these areas and speak to how USAID is using uh, this, these technologies. I know our, our panel will speak to it uh, as well. Uh, regrettably, I will not have an opportunity to listen to the panel, but I understand this is being uh, webcast, or I assume it's being webcast uh, and, and archived. Uh, so I know you all look forward very much uh, to hearing from today's authors, and we encourage you to look on our website as well. Uh, you can get electronic version of the articles. And uh, most of all, we encourage you to share your ideas with us. I may mean, imagine that you've come in, you obviously come into this uh, session with some ideas, and based on what you hear from the panelists, you'll you know, clearly have some you know, thoughts about who, how USAID and, and the entire US government can take better advantage of future analysis. So I want to thank you again, Lana Council and Wilson Center, for organizing this session, and um, look forward to, a, to a, a productive discussion. Thanks again. Thank you. So we could just invite the panelists to come up. I think yes, your your name's on the seat. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you to Barry and Mark for get, getting us started. A special thank you to our uh, colleagues and collaborators on this effort, the US Department of State, USAID, and the National Defense University. So in, in our introduction, we've gone from lost in space and the <laughs> Jetsons to futures analysis to thinking about disruption, shocks, and resilience. And I think um, we've gotten to the point of thinking of, of where we are at this moment in time, which Mark described as an amazing moment, where he talked about a roadmap out of poverty, science and technology, forecasting, scenario building, thinking a little bit about the broader implications to development, humanitarian assistance, and post-disaster recovery. So these are the topics that we want to talk about. And, and when I, I look at this book, um, The Future Can't Wait, I was thinking of the title and thinking of the outcome of the recent uh, deliberations at Rio Plus 20 and the, the agreement that came out of, of those discussions looking at the Millennium Development Goal. And the, that report is called The Future We Want. And I always felt, you know, there was a little bit of a misnomer there. There's above and beyond the future we want. I want to know the future we can have. And, and I feel that this book, The Future Can't Wait, really allows us to think about insights and perspectives on the future we can, we, 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 we can have. Um, so when I, I was looking at the book and reading it, the introduction talks about three components that I think are really about, are really important. It says that this book is about looking systematically at alternative future scenarios to better facilitate planning and project implementation for global development. And I want to talk about those three components, systematically looking at these issues. I'm impressed at the range and depth of, of authors, so 10 authors, leading authors covering a wide range of topics. We have a number of them uh, with us today. And I, uh, just a few days ago, I was chatting with one of these authors, Stephen Gale, about the report. And, and Stephen said to me, you know, Roger Mark, when you look at the report, it's interesting because all of the chapters really cover a series of seven trends. There are four technology-driven trends, and these are big data and analytics, health innovation, inventive technologies, and advanced manufacturing. And there are three systems-driven trends, and these are urbanization and smart cities, educational transformation, and demographic shifts. So I found it was interesting across the chapters, you have these seven trends. But as you look 
in the book and you read more of it, you see that there are additional trends that, that, that uh, are mentioned. For example, Linton Wells, in talking about the large technological transformations, also notes that it's very important to think about building social networks and enhancing trust with local populations and that these are just as important as technological breakthroughs. So this is very much part of what we hear, systems thinking that's currently in play, resiliency and the importance to overall development and humanitarian assistance. So it's very interesting for me as I look at this book that it's very current, it resonates with the current dialogue and it's very systematic in its treatment of these issues. The second point that I wanted to, to make is to get back a little bit to what we heard in the introductory remarks in terms of all alternative um, future scenarios. So once again, futures analysis is the systematic assessment of upcoming events, trends, and data projections that enable institutions like USAID to have more impactful and resilient development pro programs. More impactful and resilient development programs. So I hope as, as we talk about the implications of the book that we would be looking at those, those um, components. And then finally, the, the part about facilitating better planning and project implementation. This is exactly what we want to talk about on the panel today and with you. We don't so much want to talk about what's in the book. We really want to focus more on what are the implications of what's in the book. What's the so what with this book? Why is this important? Why should we care about it? And how does this advance the dialogue? So how do we move beyond what we have already articulated in, in the book? So the future can't wait, but I would say I also can't wait. I want to hear what, what you all have to say. So I, uh, we're go actually going to start by posing uh, one question to each, each of the panelists and ask uh, him or her just to, to give his or her thoughts on that particular question. And, and Matt, if that's OK, we'd like, like to start um, with you. So um, as, as you all know, Matt really is here at the Atlantic Council and is serving as a director of the street strategic foresight initiative. And Matt, I, I wanted to ask you um, a little bit from your perspective, focusing on the security community. Could you give some of your thoughts on the ways that the security community has brought discussions around environment, demographics, and development into their work? Is there, a, have you seen a, a, a general evolution in the willingness from the security community to embrace these, these elements, and how does that uh, fit into planning and operations? Yeah, of course, I, I worked um, for a decade at the National Intelligence Council, where I authored the Global Trends Reports. And I think that gives you some idea, first, of the interest um, in the national security community on um, foresight, on planning. And obviously, I think the big push we got was after 9-11, because I think there it was very apparent that very small things or what appeared to be small things before 9-11 happening in Afghanistan or, or elsewhere had huge imp implications and huge impacts in our own national security. So suddenly we couldn't ignore what's happening, um, just not in, in that case with 9-11 in terms of, of uh, terrorist groups way around the other side of the world, but also beginning to think about environment. And we did a number actually with, with um, two of the gentlemen here, Rich and, and Jeff, looking at um, uh, water, looking at food impacts, looking at particularly demographic um, trends when we are looking at the correlation between youth bulges and instability. So that we want to really look at these trends and think about, okay, what does that mean for national security and what does that mean about how to prepare? Now I think 
in many ways, the national security environment was a good one in the sense you have a Pentagon that is very geared towards thinking in the long term because their acquisition cycle is so long and is actually getting longer. Um, so you're having to think about what's the security environment in 2030 um, when you're thinking about how many aircraft carriers do you need or whatever because you've got to get started now. Um, so, you know, actually doing this work, you know, um, was met with very good reception and actually a lot of encouragement. And I think we had, you know, some notable successes. You have the State Department now has a water initiative. It has a food initiative. Obviously, AID is very much involved in those things. A lot of that came out of the work that we did with Global Trends, and then we did various spin-offs looking at um, those particularly and using a, even classified sources for, for really refining our, our analysis. And the same with, with uh, the demography. Um, so I applaud the, the AID effort. I think um, you know, what we need to do is more and more of this throughout the whole government, really think about um, the planning because I think you you actually have opportunities here as we were uh, you know as has already been discussed and it, it's obviously one planning is is part of it is to avoid the negative outcomes of the possible negative outcomes but I think for our country a more important one is how do you seize these opportunities that actually are huge uh, opportunities out there that we haven't seen before Great, thank you very much, Matt. So, um, reminding us of uh, looking at opportunities, sort of the change from 9-11, the implications of, of small things that are now recognized as being critical now, and having a sense of um, the larger acquisition cycle, for example, the Pentagon and, and sort of the security community. So, um, Rich, um, so you are, uh, currently a demographer in residence at the Stimson Center and a Global Fellow um, with us at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And, and Matt has, has talked a little bit about the demographic uh, component you know, that's being recognized by the security community. Those of us who work in demography at times hear the phrase, demography is not destiny. Could, could you talk a little bit about sort of the demographic implications um, in a future analysis scenarios and what, what are your thoughts? How does that fit in in looking at future scenarios? Sure, I'll, I'll speak from a, a forecaster or a modeler's perspective and I'll change that word from destiny to actually deterministic because mm -hmm. that's what it means. It means can we look into the future uh, using demography and know exactly what's going to happen even five or ten down, years down the road. And, Frankly, the model that uh, I've used and developed in uh, Matt shop, actually at the National Intelligence Council, is statistical. That means uh, we don't really know uh, every country what it's going to do, but we, we know demographically what's going to happen over the next 20 years. Uh, that's the way demography is. Remember, about 80% of all people who are going to be around in 20 years from now are around today. So uh, we know something about both population and age structure, the, the, the distribution of young and old. And now, because of a lot of work over the last 20 years, we know statistically about those groups of countries based upon their age structure, about their political behavior. In other words, we know that youthful countries uh, tend to get into uh, intrastate conflicts, ethnic and civil wars, we know as, as fertility declines and the age structure changes, we know now that uh, around about uh, median age of 30, that's that middle, middle person is, is 30 years old, that countries like that have about a half a chance of being liberal democracies. And that isn't just now, that's, been, that's the way it's been since the data were generated by Freedom House uh, in the early 70s. Uh, do we know which country is going to be? No, we, we don't know which half. Uh, that's a little more difficult. But, uh, and we know as countries get older, uh, they get more peaceful, 
Ultimately, they have to set up institutions, and a great deal of uh, many of them do. And ultimately, if things continue the way they, the way they have in terms of fertility, then countries will age. There will be a lot of people in the uh, retired group. Uh, and we see that now. We see three countries with median ages right around 45. That is, that middle person is 45 years old. And that uh, retirement issues are coming to bear on these countries' finances. Uh, so we know if we look in the, uh, the uh, population projections, which are already worked out for the, and pretty good for the next 20 years, we know where those countries are going, all the countries of the world. Now, how, what exactly they're going to, which pr proportion are they going to be in, that's a bit of a, a mystery. But it, it's not random. Um, if everybody remembers their statistics from when they were in college, uh, there, it, the statistical uh, distributions are based upon randomness, and there's nothing really random about countries. If we look first, uh, we looked at, at those states, uh, we see leadership issues, we see cultural and demographic issues, we see economic issues. So the challenge is to actually put a little beef on that model, and that's what I've been working on. Um, so there's nothing really deterministic about this uh, forecasting. Um, there's still mysteries as to, and, and still things that international involvement, USAID, um, our own po foreign policies can do to shift countries from one side of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of destiny to the other, actually. So, um, and uh, we, you know, when we think about the, the, the Arab Spring, I, I know some people on, in this room know that uh, for actually for Jeff's journal, while I was at the NIC, I wrote a paper uh, that called attention in 2008 to the countries of North Africa, that there would be perhaps one liberal democracy, maybe even two by 2020. And when I gave that paper, and somebody <laughs> knows this story too, I gave it for the National Intelligence Council for 24 academics in, 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 um, on the Middle East, and some of them being Arabs from the region, uh, they, they stopped me because they broke down laughing. They laughed. And so 2008, uh, I, gave, I showed them this paper that was uh, later published in Foreign Policy and with Jeff Journal and the Wilson Center, and people were hysterical with laughter. It was so hysterical, they, they were crying. Uh, that the possibility that an Arab country, uh, I mean a North African country, I, was, I did not say anything about the Middle East, a North African country could rise uh, and, and aspire to democracy, that was unbelievable at the time. But uh, democracy gave some hints. And, uh, and, and so, I, uh, so I encourage people to uh, think more about the changes that demographics uh, bring to countries. Um, it's a shock for, for women to become involved in society, for fertility to decline, for families to be small is a radical change uh, for countries. And these implications of it are extraordinary. And with that, I'll, I think I'm over. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Rich, for <clears throat> reminding us of the ways that you've made people cry. <laughs> but but really way. for letting us know what we can know and what we can't know. And really, you know, getting to this phrase about demography not being deterministic, reminding us there are certain things about population trends, population growth, aid structure that we know, that there are real connections between population dynamics and ethnic conflict, and that demography underlies it all, um, and democracy underlies it all, and it's, it's really, really very important. Thank you, Rich. So so Jeff, you've been mentioned a few times, my friend. Probably. So Jeff DeBalcourt, Professor and Director of Environmental Studies at the George V. Ivanovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs at, at Ohio University. And Jeff, I was, was quite interested as I was looking at, at your chapter in the book, you mentioned specifically four tyrannies. And I liked, your, your, I liked how you phrased this. You talked about the tyranny of the inbox, the tyranny of immediate results, the tyranny of the single sector, and the tyranny of the unidimensional measurement of success. So tell us a little bit about these tyrannies and how they fit in to this whole idea and concept of integrated development. What are you talking about? Well, uh, thank you, Roger, Mark, I, I think. Um, <laughs> The, the tyrannies, in some ways, this is an example of 
um, going to that last point that you made in introduction, Roger Mark, which is how if we, if we do the long-term trends analysis, try to understand how they fit, then how do you put them into play and how well or how poorly are our institutions for doing development set up to take account of those trends and, and, and work on them. Let me start with a story that in part gets to those tyrannies or where the, the challenges come. But um, so I, I contributed the environmental chapter and kind of came into it from that frame, but then quickly talked about all the other things we needed to pay attention to. And, and instrumental in, in uh, identifying those tyrannies and, and coming up with a title that is not terribly elegant, but actually means what um, uh, implies what I was trying to say, which is the periphery is not peripheral. And this came from actually a conversation in a, in a, a conference that we did with one of Susan's colleagues um, in uh, AID, Mary Melnick, who is on point on environment, natural resource issues in, in Asia Near East. And Mary said, you know, we are programming for the most part in biodiversity space and some food security, water uh, issues in Southeast Asia. And we, we, have a, we think we have a good handle on that. There's a lot more we could do. But what we don't have the understanding of or the time to figure out, but we have the suspicion that there are all these other trends that aren't in our portfolio specifically that really matter for what we are doing. So can you help us figure out what those are so we can get a little smarter about what's not in our portfolio or what is in theory peripheral to our portfolio um, and help us then better, underst uh, better understand and better respond to what we're doing. And so that was a process that culminated with a multi-day workshop with mostly aid people from across portfolios in Bangkok where we brought them together, folks who had not necessarily spoken with one another, and then had folks who were expert in demography, expert in trends in conflict and governance, expert in climate change and energy trends, um, and natural resource management, but really kind of again, an audience and a group of expertise that they knew in theory was important but didn't have the opportunity to engage with. And one of the insights, and hopefully there was more than one, but where it became clear that this was a useful exercise was when, and these were both aid people, when the person who was focusing on climate change on the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalayas started talking to the food security programmer in Cambodia, downstream, so to speak, and the Cambodians uh, programmers' eyes got big about what long-term trends on seasonal uh, snow melt and ice uh, melt from the Himalayas meant for the Mekong. She was like, oh my goodness, everything we're doing could be literally washed away and, and, and not be done in, if I didn't understand some of these geographically and topically remote trends to what I'm doing. Um, so in some ways, where we are now and when we sit in fora like this, where we look across these topics, that's a fairly straightforward example. But when you're day to day facing those tyrannies of single sector reporting, money that's for biodiversity and nothing else, right? And, and there are real penalties if you stray, um, and that it's how do I put out the fire or you know, deal with the inbox, then that becomes really challenging. And so it may seem a modest goal for folks to realize that what's in the periphery is not peripheral to their portfolios. And then our challenge becomes how do we systematically understand those connections and within the constraints and hopefully move a little some of those constraints, adjust those constraints uh, in which how we organize ourselves in terms of responding and trying to assist in development that we, we take account of that and more systematically have a integrated understanding and then an integrated approach to dealing with the problems. Great, thank you, Jeff. So, so I listen to you and I, I hear uh, three things that are really important for me. This, um, and I would call them the three Ps, the periphery. So you talk about this in terms of recognizing other trends that really matter for what we're doing. The second P is about people. Um, getting folks who had not really spoken to each other, getting them together and really having that meaningful dialogue. And the third P for me is on perspective, really thinking, wow, all that we're doing could be washed away. So some, some really um, important insights. So thank you, Jeff. So Susan, your name has been mentioned a few times. So you are the agency counselor at, at USAID. Um, and I wondered whether 
uh, I'm, I'm bearing in mind Jeff's last comment, you know, all that we're doing could be washed away. You sort of, I wonder if you think a little bit about that and bear that in mind. Um, and talk a little bit about USAID's approach. We've heard from the uh, security sector, the demographic sector, the environmental sector. We know technology and, and scenario planning is, is really important. How do you see all of this coming together for you at, at USAID? What lessons are you learning? What are you, what are you thinking about doing now and to integrate all of this? Right. Well, thank you. And it's just been so interesting to listen to the other panelists as well um, and to be here today at the Atlantic Council and, and partner as well with the Wilson Center. So, you know, I've been in development and actually with USAID for more than two decades. So I've been able to see sort of things come and go and emphasis. And one of the things that's really struck me over the last uh, several years is this focus that we've been talking about, about really um, getting outside of your box and looking at the larger trends. I mean, development right now is at such a pivotal point. I think we've seen just you know some major shifts in in the world and and our role. You know, whether we look at uh, clearly uh, resource flows into developing countries. Fifty years, for example, ago, for example, when USAID was created, eighty percent was through official development assistance. It's now down to about fifteen percent. It's radically changed. The private sector accounting for more than forty percent of that. Remittances, obviously, being a large factor. You know, partnering. So. In order to take advantage of uh, the, the shifting landscape or the new development landscape, if you will, you have to step back. And, and as Jeff pointed out, and I think he captured it so well in his chapter, I mean, all the chapters are really interesting to look at, but you know, how do you step back? How do you actually uh, avoid the tyranny of the inbox and the tyranny of the immediate result and really look beyond your sector, you know, as each of them has spoken, and look at the, the global trends you know, that the Nick and others have done uh, so well. So our attempt at this, you know, uh, two years ago, as a matter of fact, and, and really want to credit our science and technology uh, team who really launched this two years ago, a future symposium, which gave rise to this book, because it not only provided opportunity, often here in Washington, we get to do this. We get to, you know, step out, hopefully get out of our building, get out of our site and engage. But uh, we planned it, and Steve Gale, uh, you know, really, who organized it for us in our office, planted so our mission leadership, they were coming in, we, they only come in every two years. And so we had our mission directors and our mission leadership actually spend a day at the Future Symposium. And that gave them an opportunity. They were here for a week and many of them said that one day they learned more about what was happening outside of their country, outside of their regions, and looking at the larger trends. And I think that is so important for all of us um, to do, and then not only to obviously spend that time, but it is the follow-up. So some of the things we talked about during this symposium, uh, urbanization, uh, you know, obviously absolutely key as we look at the world becoming more urbanized. And so how then, you know, we took that and we had our first uh, service delivery in an increasingly urbanized world. Really important when Atlanta Council helped us launch that. So that it's not just the symposiums and the thing, it's that the people who are out there, because they are often out there you know, in, in these remote areas, and they may have access, but do they have time? And making it really easy for them to digest, here are the trends that are going on, as well as our youth and development policy. Uh, something that again came out of the, the Futures Conference really talking about demography and, and youth and, and whatnot, so the trends. So I just want to emphasize how important that is. So we're just, we, we've really embraced this. We understand that if we are going to really um, lead in the world in, the, in development, in international development, we really have to be able to take advantage of futures thinking and really be able to step back and, and provide that policy guidance. Because the world is changing so dramatically. Uh, you know, as Mark talked about some of the innovations um, and investments that we've made over the last couple of years, uh, it's going to, we have to stay ahead of the curve, all of us. If we look at mobile phones, as he mentioned, 6.8 billion mobile phones. I heard an incredible statistic last week at uh, an event with IBM where next year there will be more mobile devices in the world than people. 
because often we have the cell phone, we have the iPad, we have a lot of different ways of connecting. So how do we use this technology in order to help us really, really advance? Uh, and, and you know, lots of things that you, you know about. One thing that just struck me, uh, and this was almost four years ago when the Haiti earthquake struck in January 2010. And you know, as in every disaster situation, you're focusing on the immediate. How do we save lives? How do we get food and water and just the basics? And our administrator, Dr. Shaw, had just come on board and he said, well, I really want to get the mobile team involved. And I think the mobile team at that point was two people in the agency. He <laughs> said, well, that's nice. Let's put them over here. We've really got to focus on saving lives and like no, no they're going to help us they're going to help us in the rebuilding effort and you flash forward you know, they started working immediately on how do we get mobile technology out there during the disaster response and the recovery. And you know, within three years, there were five million transactions that were made through mobile solutions. And it was everything from you know working on remittances coming in to help in the rebuilding effort to paying uh, for schools for their kids so that they could get back to a new normal. You know, to obviously salary. So the, the power of technology is is really transformative. And I think you know. You know, we haven't really completely unwrapped that. We at USAID, and you've heard our administrator talk about this, is that uh, you know we're we're going to really be taking science, technology, innovation, and partnership, which we've been developing over the last couple of years, but put it to a new level and having a new platform uh, to really help us move forward on this goal of ending extreme poverty. Because as he and others have said, we are not going to pay our way to success. We are not going to meet this goal in our same traditional ways of approaching it. That we have to look at new approaches, uh, new partnerships. Uh, you know, clearly again, the power of, of partnering uh, from everything from higher education institutions to think tanks uh, to obviously the private sector to, to students. Um, we are at an incredible moment where the youth around the world want to be engaged in making this world a better place. Uh, one of the examples I like to use is uh, the Pratt pouch, which I, I was looking for. I couldn't find it uh, before I came up here. But it is a catch-up size pouch that was developed by students at Duke University, which contains uh, antiretroviral drugs and can be maintained for a year without refrigeration. This was developed by students at an incredibly low cost as a result of our Saving Lives at Birth Grand Challenge. As we know, 90% of, of uh, HIV is developed in children by mother-to-child transmission. If we want an HIV, the uh, free world, which we believe is within our grasp, it's these small technologies and these innovative approaches that can get us there. So I think we're at a really exciting period in time for development. Um, and I think you know clearly the work that we've all been doing collectively on futures development is part of, uh, part of the solution. Great, thank you. So uh, it's it's very interesting to me um, to hear you talk about your perspective and having seen things come and go, appreciate the shifting landscape. You talk about the new normal, and, and very often as someone who works on integrated development, I find that when I go out and speak to partners or, or, or leading thinkers about these issues, be it systems analysis or systems thinking or resiliency or future analysis, I sometimes get the reaction, well, is this just new wine in old bottles? Is it just sort of the same old? Um, so there is a sense that this is new, it's important. The question that I have, and I, I think, Susan, you were getting a little bit of this, is how do we get this to take root? What concretely can we do to make sure that it takes root? So you talk about partnering, you talk about private sector engagement, you talk about education and involvement of students. I'd like to open up to the panel. What, what do we need to do to ensure that this is not just a, a passing fad? Um, how do we ensure that this, this approach of futures analysis is able to take root? What are we doing now? Any thoughts, Matt? Well, I, I think, you know, from my experience, you do need a dedicated unit, and it doesn't have to be very big but somewhere in your organization that has the mission of doing the future analysis. Because I don't think you can, you can assign this to, you know, more broadly, and there have been efforts in the intelligence community to do that, and it just doesn't work because nobody feels the, the real responsibility and the ownership for it. 
But the second, I think, even more important point is, is that, and I don't think we're entirely there yet, is connecting it with the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So it has to, um, you know, I think we got very good reception from the uh, global trends. I uh, actually, before we published the last edition, um, the National Security Advisor um, called up and we had several briefings, you know, months before it came out. I mean, that was a... Uh, showed his interest, and then you had lots of interest from uh, around the decision making, the policy making community. Um, but I think you could probably do even better. I mean, in the sense of getting that analysis, uh, you know, inserted into um, the decision making process. So when they sit around the table and, and discuss something, they also have uh, an idea of the the longer term trends and also sometimes the unintended consequences of dealing in one way or another with, with the particular crisis. Because you're always going to have, you know, the, 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 the near term always trumps the long term. Because you got a crisis, if it's Haiti or if it's <laughs> Syria or whatever that's happening, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, they're going to be dealing with that. But there's also, at those points, some opportunities for getting them to think about some of the longer term trends. Um, just as you had the wonderful example of saying, well, what about mobile technology? I mean, I, you know, I, and inserting that into the decision making. And I don't think. You know, your policymakers are going to be uh, adverse to it. I mean, what they're much more, you know, somebody has to do it for them at that point. Um, and I think we have to design a decision making process where that naturally comes to bear. Yes? Well, <laughs> since I was in that unit that, <laughs> that Matt is talking about, he's taken a little bit of the wind out of myself. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, actually, to follow on what Matt said, I always thought that um, once you have that unit, how could you, on a on a on an almost weekly or monthly basis, touch touch the the units that uh, need to think a little bit ahead? How would you do it? I'm not so sure that I have an answer because we yeah. we never got there. We never got to the point where, uh, and we had occasional uh, national intelligence officers who. Uh, invited myself and other members of that unit in uh, in a discussion, uh, but that was their initiative, and uh, it didn't become something that uh, uh, is is permanent. And I wish it it were. I wish that um, you know. Right now, we we believe that uh, that uh, unfortunately, I think that every country is an anecdote, that it's completely unique. And that uh, its history and culture uh, have to be known by a, a, an expert who's lived there. Now, I've lived overseas, if people know my career, I've lived overseas uh, more than 10 years and have, and have done that kind of work. And um, now that I'm doing this, I, uh, I'll tell you what, I, I don't trust my prejudices from living in those countries. I, I refer to my work instead because I, the countries are not anecdotes. Yes, there are things that are unique about them. Um, but they, those, uh, I think we trust that analysis a little too much, and we did in the Arab Spring. There's a great example. Then other people say, we did in the Soviet Union, we did in Iran. You can go on and on and on. So there's things to learn from this type of analysis, and I don't say it should trump people's expertise and in-depth knowledge and linguistic abilities, uh, but I think it should be at the table, and it should be there at a on a regular basis. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, kind of to, to go down the row and, and, and build on it, I think it's with the, with the work that's done and then sharing and informing and showing the decision makers and the, the folks who do have the, both the authority and the brief that's broader, convincing them it's to adopt in some ways the same approach that some of these grand challenges where you're asking others outside to be innovative, to look and find ways to, to incentivize and give authority and resources and time to do that internally. We, we often think of um, innovation and entrepreneurship as something that's creating something in a lab and it's done by the private sector. 
um, at, at Ohio University, what one of the really interesting things within our school of public affairs is that we have a center for public and social innovation that's about policy innovation. And so in that sense, providing the space for those who may be assigned a specific portfolio and a pot of money, creating those incentives because you're defining success differently or more broadly or in a multi-dimensional fashion. You may have different timelines. I mean, some of, some of particularly coming from the environment side and some of the health stuff, Roger Mark and a number of people in the room, um, uh, Rich, we've worked on this integrated population health environment. Part of the challenges there is the environmental success story is long-term and something not happening. And some of the health stuff you can see right away, you know what the innovation is, or you know what the technological or services delivery would be. And so just finding ways to, to talk, not just from a detached analytical perspective, but from a hands-on, how do you get it done? Mm -hmm. And rewarding with those some of those challenge exercises that innovation inside. And, and frankly, um, as big a challenge, and, and Matt's had a lot of success in, in say communicating with the executive branch decision makers on this. Ultimately, when it comes back to some of these tyrannies, it's educating our appropriators <laughs> and having them be willing to provide space and resources that are not overly prescribed in ways that make this kinds of integrated work uh, possible. Thank you. Another easy oh. target audience, yeah. right? <laughs> To build on that, that's right. I mean, you, we need the, if you will, a center of gravity within any institution to create, have a little bit of that space. Because it's not that people don't want to be thinking about this, these issues, they do. Uh, whether you're in the field or you're you know, in a different place working on the, you, you want to be thinking about the trends and moving forward. But there has to be a place you can reach into. And that's what we've tried to create through our Office of Science and Technology and our, our IDEA office and bringing that together as a platform that other parts not of the agency can reach into, but then most importantly, as my colleagues are pointing out, how they can reach out because we will never have enough resources. Definitely, um, you know, in the development world as compared to the defense world where you have the DARPA. Uh, and if we thinking in terms of a DARPA for development, how do you then create that little space that then can reach out to the universities, to to the think tanks, to to others who are just being really creative? The the Argentinian mechanic who came up with a yes. life saving device which ended up on the front page of the New York Times. There are a lot of people thought, thinking about challenges and then the solutions. And so how do we bring them in uh, to, to really the, the, the feeling as though they're part of the entire effort? Um, because uh, you know, as much as uh, we would love to see our budgets increase and we would love to be able to have that capacity directly, for example, within USAID or the State Department or other government agencies, we also know um, that that's less realistic. And so then how do we open up and how do we partner in a way that that provides you know provides the practitioner with those tools and and that sustenance to really be able to think beyond the tyranny in the inbox great thank you so i'd like to open it up a little bit i know that we have some of the chapter authors here um so i'd like to also hear from you I'd like you to be part of this discussion before we open it up more broadly and the, the question that i have for you and, and steve Perhaps I hope it's okay to start with you. I'd, I'd like um, you, you helped pull this together in many ways, and I wonder, you know, in chatting to you to you about this event, you know, you said to me, Roger Mark, we worked on this a few months ago. You work on a book. You understand it takes this a process to get it out. When you reflect on it now and look at it now, look at the book now, do you think there's anything that's missing? Well, and then we have a, a microphone. First, uh, congratulations to everyone of uh, the speakers. Uh, it's very dynamic uh, background. Uh, first of all, uh, for me, and like Susan, I've spent most of my career, almost 90% uh, of it, at USAID. And so I asked the question, what's, what's the practical next steps? And there are many colleagues here who I'm sure can uh, reinforce those. But I think a couple of things come to mind. One is that our for a number of reasons we won't have time to get into, our programming cycle tends to be, it used to be for many years, three years. Mm -hmm. And we made a quantum leap to five years. So, we, so there's something about our program cycle that puts a uh, heavy emphasis on the shorter term rather than the longer term. And some of those 
uh, are inevitable consequences of our budgeting cycle. So that's, that's a constraint that I think we have to examine and see how is it possible to do futures planning, which is long-term planning, beyond three to five years. Uh, I don't have a, you know, a ready answer for that, but there's something about our program, program cycle that works against long-term planning. I think the other, the other reflection I had was that you need, uh, because we're 8,000 with our partners working, nothing that we say here in this room uh, is really as important as the people in the field understanding it. So if we make f a futures analysis, a Washington-centric, cent we're, we're probably going to lose in the long run because it, ha it has to get to the field. And I like the idea of, rec of recognition. We're thinking about maybe there's a way to incentivize. Uh, you know, uh, many people in aid are doing futures. They, they may not think it's futures or foresight, but they're doing it, especially in our, in our health bureau. So we need to sort of, uh, we, we need to recognize those who are already doing it and expand it. And I think we have to do a bit of education about why futures is important, and we have to build the capacity. So I think those are the three kinds of reflections I have that can you know, chart a, a road ahead so that this is not just uh, you know, the uh, trend de, de jour and that it will have some lasting power. Great, any of the other authors? Well, I can't get around Steve since he handed me the microphone. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Andy Reynolds, I was responsible for chapter five and I must say that um, the first impression of this whole exercise and the collective wisdom in this room and the wider audience that um, and, and a group of experts that participates in futures planning. This report demonstrates that the issue and all that was discussed two years ago at the conference has shelf life. Mm. And I think to um, identify with a couple of the themes that the panelists so aptly addressed, uh, Matt points out that continuity is everything and the notion that you need a devoted group of people in organizations worrying about futures analysis. And that's not an easy proposition for the day-to-day -day management, the tyranny of the inbox. Because with all of our work, you come in the door and there's a fire on the desk and you put it out. So there isn't much room for contemplative space, the medium and long term. And it takes a, an important um, commitment on the part of managers to devote those resources where they're needed. So that would be the first point I would emphasize. And the second, which is connected to the policymaker and make it relevant. And that's also the tyranny of the inbox because the political cycles, the economic cycles, the planning cycles, the budget cycles are all short term. So there needs to be a devoted community of interest to keep the flame burning. And I compliment the Scowcroft Center for taking this in and serving as that banner. Then I would uh, like to emphasize a number of things that were also discussed, but um, also were teased out in the session that I helped to chair. And that was the role of the millennials and the role of universities and the public-private partnerships and that virtuous cycle that really is so very powerful. And Susan pointed out that the total change in the demographics of assistance funding over the last decade or two and that public-private partnerships are really the, the currency of the realm now, not only in the United States but globally. And a Washington-centric philosophy is a very dangerous one when the world is moving away at light speed. So in fact, what we tried to tease out in our chapter was the notion that we have to get with the program. Mm -hmm. And the program is other stakeholders. There are so many. And now unleashed with information and communication technologies and undergirded with the science and technology and engineering proposition, this is where the action will be and will grow. And we have to be sure that our assistance community moves in lockstep and exploits those partnerships as much as possible. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's open it up. Some questions, thoughts, reactions. Um, I'll ask you to identify yourself and um, to um, go ahead, please. I'm Ronald Marks, I'm a member here at the council. This is for Matt. Um, I'm interested in the intellectual framework for this. Um, I, the reference before to Isaac Asimov and psychohistory made me smile a little bit, but there was somewhat of a framework that he had in mind, particularly with regards to the fact that these events that you may be talking about aren't discrete. 
that in fact one may affect the other and there may be effects back and forth, whether it's a growth policy that affects energy policy that suddenly puts you in the business of fracking, that suddenly puts you in the business of threatening local agriculture or, or health. Can you talk a little bit about that, Matt, just for how you, how you pursued at least that this section of the, uh, of the report, uh, that kind of thing? Thank you. Let's take a few questions. Yes, please, if you can identify yourself as speaker yeah. microphone. Good morning. Thank you so much for this report. I'm Lindsay Coates with Interaction, which is an association of, of uh, not-for-profits that are working to address poverty and hunger issues uh, globally. I have a, a question that sort of goes back to the system and the, and the broader futures analysis. I'm not, a, I'm not a futurist at all, but I'm fascinated by the work and the topic. And, and what I'm interested in is it seems to me there's an implicit assumption in the conversation that the nation state continues as a viable way to organize addressing poverty. And when I, when I step back and I think about some of the trends you all have talked about, you've talked about local civil society and how important that is in terms of disrupting the system. You've also talked about technology, um, and Edward Snowden is a great advertisement for technology and an individual being a total disruptor of the nation state. And then you look at corporations which often pride themselves on not being tied to any nation. So it's, it seems to me, as, as not even an amateur, just an outside observer, that there are some questions about the role of the nation state in addressing poverty, yet our aid system definitely assumes, even though ODA is increasing, that it's an integral part. And so I'm wondering if, if the book perhaps questions that assumption. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, please, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Jonathan Peck. I am a futurist and uh, uh, work at the Institute for Alternative Futures. My question is, if you were to look at where our government is, and, and thankfully USAID is taking some leadership in futures and foresight, and, uh, compare it to, say, Singapore, England, Canada, uh, on a scale of simple awareness that the future is going to be different to a more complex understanding uh, with multiple scenarios and groups dedicated to doing this, all the way to Isaac Asimov's mastery of uh, psychohistory. Where do you think you are? OK. Uh, yes, please, gentlemen here. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, how can you bring together some of the technologies you've talked about, uh, the internet and mobile devices, to get people's economic consensus in their communities for what they're gonna do? Thank you. Yes, please, at the back. Uh, David Burwell, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, I'd like to push back a little bit, uh, Rich, on the question, on his point that uh, countries are not anecdotes, and also this uh, comment about the role of nation states. Uh, since I work for an organization that is f totally focused on nations as unique, uh, nation that. states <laughs> as unique institutions, I'd like to raise the possibility that the, that the, the, the problem analysis uh, and futures analysis may be uh, uh, more global or more demographic, but the solutions uh, to these problems are intensely uh, nation-state specific. Uh, you're dealing with entirely different cultures and kleptocracies and ways of, uh, of uh, economic development. So is this a legitimate, I guess my question, is this a legitimate distinction that we can look at the uh, futures analysis in terms of problem identification, but you have to be extremely specific on nation states on problem solutions. Thank you. We had a, did you have your hand up? Yes, gentleman with the, with the yes. Uh, I have a question uh, <coughs> which uh, has stumped me for the last couple of uh, years. Uh, the Obama administration took office uh, they had a Secretary of State who was very knowledgeable about development issues. 
uh, we produced, or you produced, a uh, massive document, the QDDR. Uh, now, I think aid is reforming itself in a, a marvelously creative way, uh, but aid is only one of the 45 other agencies in the U.S. government who are doing development in one form or another. What happened to the QDDR? Uh, most people that I've worked with never want to look back rather than look forward to figure out how you have uh, a government-wide policy that really works because there's a tremendous amount of, of talent within the U.S. government in various places, but it's not being mobilized. And there's no push uh, uh, to uh, do something about it now, as far as I can tell. And this happened, of course, as I've been around long enough to, uh, to know, that uh, the Defense Department didn't emerge until uh, you had a unified agency dealing with defense and security. Uh, that has to be done. Uh, in the development field, or uh, we will not get what we want out of this. And the striking, uh, the striking data is that uh, for the trade uh, people, uh, roughly 50 to 55 percent of U.S. trade, global trade as a matter of fact, uh, does not go in, uh, in arm's length uh, transactions for you buy something from me and I buy something from you, it all goes in global value chains. And that is a fundamental change uh, in world trade. So I would really like uh, someone to talk, Susan, it may not be you, by the way, uh, about what happened to the QDDR, why it didn't have any impact. Great, Ms. Sicker, thank you. A couple more questions, yes, please. Gentleman in front here. Hi, my name is, my name is Jay Demlo. I am a uh, retired development economist and uh, futurist. I guess I could add those two together. Um, I want to stick with Matt's point for a second about the notion of institutionalizing the concept of, of scenarios and, and you know, the development of future thought within an institution. Um, and also sort of pick up a little bit of what Andy said. I mean, yeah, you can put it in, in place, um, and the, a unit can, can wander around and have a wonderful time. And I mean, if all, and I don't know how many people here have done scenario planning, but it truly is one of the most fun things you can do with your clothes on. I mean, it really <laughs> is a blast. And, and you know, it, it's not done enough, certainly within the federal government. And within the State Department, where it was done for a while, uh, and with, with a USAID as well, one of the, the problems had, was that you had a unit or units and you had no management buy-in whatsoever. And part of that, I think, is an issue of the short time frame that policymakers live with, not only in terms of what they're looking at, but how long they're going to be in place. Uh, part of it is to do with the Hill. They also have a very short-term attitude. And is there not a way, you know, other than going to legislate it, which I think isn't necessarily going to work, GIPRA is a pretty good example of legislation that required planning that didn't terribly, wasn't terribly successful. Um, is there any role for somebody like the Atlantic Council to, to grade the way institutions do these kinds of things? Um, I remember, pardon my memory here, but there was a, 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 the Mercatus Institute that was attached to George Mason University <coughs> uh, shortly after GIPRA became law, actually issued grades on every executive, inst you know, executive agency as to how they were performing with respect to GIPRA. Now management, again, it didn't care a great deal, but nobody really wanted to be an F. Right. Um, and I'm thinking in terms of, you know, this was, this the book is based on a conference that took place two years ago, the first ever conference like this. When's the second one going to take place? Okay. Uh, and you know, is there, you know, has the, the administrator, for example, taken top leadership off on a retreat to examine future scenarios? And if not, why not? I mean, how, does, how do we get those kinds of things to be put Great. into place? Let's take one more question and then from you, and then we'll give the panel a chance to respond. 
Um, thank you very much for uh, a very interesting discussion. Um, my name is Alina Zhushkovsky. I'm with the Global Development Network. Uh, we're an organization that works with researchers in developing countries. And uh, one of the things that struck me just looking at it is, uh, first of all, uh, that the authors do not seem to be from a developing country. So having a developing country perspective, the beneficiaries' countries um, to have, uh, there's obviously uh, very thoughtful people who are working on future scenarios. Um, and I certainly know a number of those researchers. And the second is that um, there's only one woman and so the role of women is something that uh, I think the panel should be able to comment about looking out into the future. Certainly, uh, I would like to hope that it is addressed in this book. Great, thank you. <clears throat> A wonderful set of questions for us to, to contemplate. So around the intellectual framework, the role of the nation state, where is the US government now linking technology and um, economics? Um, recognizing that the problem analysis may be at the global level, but solutions may be at the level of the nation state. Lessons from the QDDR, um, question about institutionalizing this approach and grading those who are doing work on this and developing country perspective and bringing in more women and women's perspectives. So uh, short list. <laughs> Susan, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, it's Take a long your pick. List. I'll, well, I'll try and answer a couple of them because I think there were, is an intersection of a lot of the discussions about, uh, you know, again, institutions and that we not only think about formal institutions but informal institutions and whether that's civil society or the role of women in, uh, in gender issues uh, is something that's very important to us in the agency. But really, as I was talking about, of how do you bring all of the different actors uh, into this. And so one of the things I didn't mention and, and actually came a bit out of this symposium when we talked about systems. And when we tr traditionally think about systems um, and complexity theory, for example, we think of the, about the formal systems and we th think about working nation state to nation state. Uh, USAID is about to come out with a systems uh, framework, local systems framework, which I think uh, many of you uh, were a part of and, and hopefully shared some of your thoughts on because it's really having again development uh, professionals to be thinking about the entire system you know whether it's the private sector or you know the student or the cooperative leader or whoever is playing a role within the developing that society and so I think getting away from the traditional uh, approach of, of government to government n not ignoring the importance of the nation state is an important uh, point there um, the, the other question that came up was, you know, so, okay, it's great. You we, we talked a lot about technology. We talked about mobile phones. We talked about, you know, some of the solutions and whether it's robotics and drones actually working in disaster zones. Uh, so it's not just uh, for Amazon, as, as uh, we heard a couple weeks ago in 60 Minutes. But so these are really um, creative innovative. But what does it mean for actually development? What does it mean for economic growth? Well, when I was talking about the Pratt Pouch a couple minutes ago, well, this contributes to economic growth because if the country is not having to spend its scarce resources on antiretroviral drugs and on preventing uh, an AIDS crisis from taking full bloom, as we saw, uh, as we saw in the continent of Africa, then that helps the economic growth of countries. So often we don't see the immediate link, but but it's clearly there. You know, as far as where is uh, the U.S. government, I appreciate the question on uh, the Q to DR. Uh, it, often the Q to DR gets a lot of attention. We don't talk about the Presidential Policy Directive, which I think really gets to your point on global development. That was the first time. Um, in September 2010 when the president announced uh, the first ever global development policy uh, directive since President Kennedy created not only USAID but the Peace Corps, but really a global development policy because as you pointed out, there are many different actors just even within our own government uh, engaged in development and how do we really have one policy where we focus? Well, if you look at that and you know now flash forward more than three years later, it maybe doesn't get as much attention, but what we as a government decided was absolutely critical was one, we did need to have a lead development institution and that was USAID. Um, two, that we needed to have evidence-based policy decision-making. We could not 
just focus on anecdote to anecdote and looking at country situation. We really needed evidence, um, evaluation, research methods that really informed our decision making. We needed science, technology, innovation, and partnership. These are all core elements of the presidential policy directive. And maybe it's good that we're not talking about it as much now because actually I think we as a community are all doing that. Thank you. Jeff? Um, thank you. I'll, I'll pick up on maybe two very different questions. One is to start with saying that uh, I got into this actually in part with, with Leon Firth coming in when he was running foreign policy for then Senator Gore, pushing different parts of the government to look at, in that case, environmental issues and security issues and conflict issues together. And, and so we've, in some ways, and with the, my four tyrannies of all the difficulties of doing this, we've forgotten how far we have come in part with some of that enlightened leadership who listens and, and then gives not just a fishing license but instruction to do more integrated work. And that you know, a place like um, Matt's old uh, shop where I can remember when we collaborated in the 90s, it was um, really a, a culture change to think that the environmental assessments within an intelligence context would be anything that you'd share with another government or get opinion from outside. Whereas now Matt and his colleagues see there are all this expertise that we can draw on and we go and part of preparing it and part of briefing it out is doing it overseas and getting all that. So institutions change on these issues and become much more accepting. Um, and I think that's in fact, um, in, in many ways, the security community has mu been much more open to that than some of us on the development and environment area to see, for example, that the security community is all about risk analysis scenario and gaming for alternative futures. And if, if at least in the environmental realm, that's what we need to be doing and are doing in many ways, and we need to adopt that precautionary approach, which uh, is kind of fundamental to security. So I, th I, I'm, I don't want to be so pessimistic as to suggest the, the barriers are impossible to overcome, because I think we are, we have improved. Um, the other would be to pick up on the, the role of women, uh, in part because um, while laying out that need for integrated response, um, we didn't talk so much about one of the examples that I use in, in, in my chapter is really a, a one that's heavily influenced about ways to recognize that, for example, women in developing countries have multiple sources of vulnerability. And we can't just pick one that is our favorite or that we have money or clear that it has to be an integrated approach to do that. And this is this population health environment livelihoods approach that tests some of those institutional structures on this side. But if in part we take our cue from how people are living in, in, in many parts of the world, they have those multiple challenges and we need to um, become more creative and to, to, again, evidence that it's there and we need to learn from that folks are doing that in ways that we need to capture those lessons and, and scale up and scale out, so to speak. Thank you. Rich? Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I'll try to, I thought one was directed specifically toward me, which was, uh, and I'm glad because I, I, I try to uh, stimulate that kind of question. I'd like to pursue it further. <clears throat> Is every country an anecdote? Are there things that make them, uh, uh, do, you, do you necessarily have to treat every country uh, as to its history and culture? And um, as I said, I've, I've, I've lived in, in, uh, overseas and spoken uh, several languages in the countryside and done things that uh, I thought that was the case. And uh, so I, I tried to, uh, you know, in, in, this, in this type of work, I've tried to create tools that would, um, after seeing how, how well it worked out, and I mean, with, with ex uh, extraordinary limitations, of, what, as, of course, but to produce a tool that would um, help people uh, understand uh, development or state building a little better than I think they do. And I think part of the problem is that we do believe that countries are anecdotes. And that, um, uh, and and I get this impression because I, I, on uh, when I was in uh, uh, Matt's Matt's uh, unit, I traveled around to different uh, governmental and educational institutions. Uh, one being West Point, and uh, when I gave talks there, I noticed that uh, 
most of the cadets who were going to either Iraq or Afghanistan really truly believed that at the end of it there would be a democracy, a resilient democracy in those countries. And according to my, uh, my uh, calculations and very simple model that uh, the, pr proportion, the, pr the probability was very low, it was for you know, around 10%, 7% for some countries. So, uh, and, and now this, this you know, I, I, that, that was shocking for me because I had to, to actually say I didn't think they were going over for that reason. There were other reasons and uh, uh, their professors needed to rethink this, <laughs> however they got to this. And this was in the early 2000s. So, um, then uh, I, I gave a, a, a I put together a, 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 presentation, a set of presentations, a seminar on Yemen. And that was just after President Saleh started to, to drop off the end of the table. And, uh, and we gathered people from Yemen, uh, women, men, uh, academics who had been to Yemen, who worked specifically on Yemen. And in that day, I probably heard the most rosy uh, 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 descriptions of Yemen's possibilities. And once again, I, at the end of the, the, uh, the, the sessions that I was moderating, I would say, well, you know, I, I haven't been there. <laughs> but uh, given its, its demography and given other aspects of its educational background and politics, uh, I find it very hard to believe what you're saying. And, and not only was, was, were these uh, experts, there were two ambassadors from the US to Yemen who participated in this. You know, they were completely, had a completely uh, misrepresented uh, Yemen. Uh, so now where are we? Does that mean that what they think and what they learned is invaluable? No, it doesn't. Um, does it mean that all the, the 20 academics that I gave a lecture to and laughed me off the stage didn't know anything? I don't think so. I, they do know something. But we got to get a, find another way to get a grip on ourselves here because uh, uh, in this town, we're, pr we're presenting a lot of information and presenting countries in ways that it is completely impossible. I mean, that, I can't say that. I, I went over the, I just went over the line. It's, the, it's like betting on a horse. And that's what, uh, that's what the State Department, that's what the foreign policy is about. It's about looking at the possibilities um, and finding out if there is a chance and treating countries in a way um, that uh, brings out their best potential, um, but does not overstate it. I think a lot of the, lot of um, what we've intended for in terms of uh, political liberalization, uh, has, you know, has, not, has been. Uh, we spent that currency, and uh, and we have very little to show for it. Um, but on the other hand, uh, my if you take a look at the demography. Um, you do see countries. You do see countries that are on the verge of making some big changes, and there's where we should be with those kind of programs. Um, otherwise, we should be worrying about education, uh, uh, family planning, and uh, uh, people's health, um, so that countries do prepare themselves for a demographic transition and, uh, and, and uh, a human capital transition that leaves them in a situation where they can make econo uh, respond uh, economically and in terms of uh, governance. Great, thank you, Rich. Matt, some last thoughts from you? Yeah, on the, uh, Ron raised a point on, on the, uh, the mental framework, really, for, for, for this kind of work. And I'd say, you know, it is very challenging. We've all talked here about how the periphery actually matters. Well, one of the issues there is that there are lots and lots of things happening on the periphery. So in order to put together uh, really futures analysis, you have to think about what is your narrative? I mean, thinking about first how the uh, trends may relate to one another, thinking about underlying drivers so that you can explain this without having long laundry lists of, of possibilities or, or various trends that could happen. And I think, uh, you know, that is one of the big challenges when you're presenting a paper. And you always get pushed, as we did when we were I was doing the global trends work, I mean, to, to be more and more comprehensive. But we also knew that there was a, you know, 
the executive branch maybe have a good appetite for this, but it wasn't uh, an appetite for a 500 page work on it. And in some ways, I, I think that is um, as big a challenge as understanding is also the challenge of communicating it and communicating it so it also means that you know things have to be taken now in order to avert or to enhance certain different futures. Um, talking, uh, there's a gentleman raised about who may do this better, and Singapore, Canada probably are very good examples. I mean, in Singapore case, and we actually had Peter Ho here uh, a week ago for our tech forum. Um, conference and of course he was the architect really of a foresight system in the Singapore government and that is where you have cells in all the different departments and you also have one in the Prime Minister's office. Now as he will, was the first to admit there is still that tension I mean I, I, you know he's, a, he's now continuing um, and he says you know at times he's unwelcome and I think that's that's something that you have to expect in this business when you're doing futures. There's, you know, it sometimes just appears to the policymaker as an added complication. Somebody coming in saying, "Well, your policy you may want to rethink that. It could have these unintended <laughs> long-term policies." Um, but that tension, I think, is rather good. Um, over the long run, it keeps us thinking about how can you know. What do we need to be thinking about in terms of, of new policies? Um, and for the policymaker, I mean, in the end, uh, the, the good ones really do appreciate the, the challenge. I'd say on the UK that it, uh, unfortunately, part of its system was really hurt by the budget um, uh, declines. And so they're trying to get that back in some ways, I mean, because they realize that um, they sacrificed too much there. And, um, on the nation state, uh, I'll just make a plug here for the nation state. <laughs> um, you know, I'm the first and in the Nick's work, I mean, we talked about individual empowerment. That was a huge driver. We started the work there. So, you know, I'm the first to admit that the non-state uh, side has really exploded, both in the amplitude of what it's doing and its power. But there are the bottom billion. There are countries, there are situations which really do rely on foreign assistance or foreign help and which the private sector isn't necessarily getting to. And we saw, again, going back to the tech forum, and the interesting thing, if you're looking at for who funds basic fund, uh, research in this country, it's not the private sector. It is the state. Even though the private sector has benefited enormously from what DARPA does, everything in the iPhone that makes that smart is actually DARPA, not all the other, um, you know, if it's Google or anybody else. So that's something to keep in mind. I mean, as a, and I think in this country, we, we tend to have a bias against the state uh, when we should be thinking about, well, what, what areas does the state do well and where does it need to play? And those are often areas that involve enormous amount of risk. Um, and then where are things that we, you know, the private sector is more than able to do and that's where it's going to get the real lift. And that's really what we have to be thinking about. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so some quick concluding remarks from the panel. Think about a dedicated unit that be, can be doing this kind of work. How do you connect with decision-making processes? How do you make it take root? How do you find um, opportunities to have others adopt the approach through incentives, giving authority, creating a space to innovation? How do you bring those who are thinking about these issues but are not part of the conversation or those who may be already doing this work but uh, don't recognize that they're doing it in this way. What are the practical next steps? How do you get folks in the field to understand and apply it, recognizing that this type of analysis has a long shelf life and 
really thinking of, of creating a devoted community to test this approach and, and to keep the flame going. So please join me in thanking the authors for a, an excellent contribution um, in thinking about why the future can't wait and for the panelists for framing this for us and thinking about the implications. Thank you very much.